MoFi's Source Points V10 Master Edition. Currently up for nomination for one of the longest speaker names, at least so far this year. Uh, let's just go ahead and call it what it is. It's a badass speaker. If you are watching this video in hopes to get validation for a purchase you are considering making, go ahead and buy it. You don't need me to tell you anything else. It's a, it's a badass speaker. That said, I will have a couple affiliate links down in the comment section below. If you want to click one of those, that earns me a small commission, no additional cost to you. And that allows me to keep doing these kind of reviews and go through all the effort that I go through for these reviews. And you'll see some of that in a little bit. The V10 is a new design from Andrew Jones at MoFi. And they debuted it, I believe, in April at Exponent in Chicago. And I was actually there to check it out. Now, I only got to hear them a little bit, but I was really excited to hear this in my home and to get a chance to review it. And that said, these did come from the manufacturer. They did not pay me. I was not given anything in exchange to review these speakers. They just loaned them to me to review and I'm sending them right back. I wish that I could keep them, but frankly, I just don't have the space with me swapping speakers in and out all the time for all of these reviews. But if I did, or maybe if I just said, hey, I'm tired of reviewing, I think these would be the speakers that I would buy. To me personally, they are number two behind the Kef Blade 2 Meta. As far as all the speakers that I've heard, they are number two. And that includes some pretty significant speakers, such as the Dutch and Dutch 8C, a fantastic speaker, JBL's 4367, JBL's M2, and then there are many others that I've probably since forgotten. So for me to put this at my personal number two is saying a lot. And keep in mind, the Kef Blade 2 Meta is about $29,000 per pair. These run for about $8,000 per pair. Big price difference. The reasons why you should buy the MoFi V10. First of all, let's assume that you've got plenty of space. These are big speakers, as you can see in this photo. Now I'm about five foot 11, maybe six foot two, depending on who's asking. These speakers are at about 49 inches or 125 centimeters tall. They weigh in at about 160 pounds each or around 72, 73 kilograms. Again, each. Lugging these things inside your home is going to be a bit of a pain in the butt. If you want to set these up on a four foot tall platform, like I did in this photo to measure them on my clip near field scanner, have fun. <laughs> or if you want to take these outside, like I did in this case, and then measure them in the ground plane method to verify your results from your near field scanner, again, have fun. But in all seriousness, I appreciated my time with these speakers. I've learned a lot about them and I've learned a little bit about what I go after. These speakers are not the most linear speakers, but they have really good linearity. These speakers have a very good combination of all the things that I look for in a loudspeaker. Wide radiation horizontally, so it gives you a wide sense of development. Low bass extension to about 30 hertz in room. You don't have to have a subwoofer unless you're listening to pipe organs rumble at around 17 hertz. Some music has that. They also have really good on-axis linearity, but they're best positioned when they're slightly towed away from the listening position. Now, I would not point them directly out into the room, but maybe about 10 to 15 degrees behind the listening position would be ideal. Doing that will level out some of the high frequency. Now, speaking of the high frequency, these come with three options on the back, a low, medium, and high treble attenuation. So high attenuation is really no attenuation at all. Medium knocks off about maybe a decibel and a half, and then low is another decibel and a half. So you've got about three decibel swing from the high to the low setting, and that runs just on the treble. So once you get these speakers set up in your room, if you want to play around with the treble switch to get the, uh, the high frequency more attuned to what you're after, you can certainly do that, and you don't have to have equalization. And that's a plus, at least in my part. Now, I do always recommend equalization for bass, but if you are a person who doesn't really want to deal with equalization and you don't want to deal with an extra subwoofer, this is your speaker. The way that it presents sound is unlike a speaker that I have yet to hear. It is big. It is enveloping. And I actually had to take some notes because as I listened to these over the span of about a week and a half off and on, I continued to find things that I really just flat out enjoyed. So let me read from my notes, okay? The first thing you're going to have to do with these speakers is mentally prepare yourself for a big speaker. 
If you're like me, most of the time you're coming from a bookshelf speaker or maybe a medium sized floor standing speaker. These are on another level, guys. Unless you're coming from something large like a Wilson speaker or something significantly larger than your standard tower speakers that you can get from the big box stores, this is going to be something altogether different and you are going to have to mentally prep yourself for the sound that you're about to be influenced by. And when I say it's a wall of sound, I'm not really exaggerating. When you fire these things up, you're going to feel like your volume is too loud, almost certainly. So you're going to back down on the volume some. Some of that certainly due to the sensitivity of these speakers, which is around 89 decibels or so on average. Uh, but some of that is just the fact that they're so imposing and so large and they take up so much real estate on the floor compared to smaller speakers, of course, that they actually are a little bit closer to you. So you're going to want to bring the volume down a little bit. Now, after you do that and you get more attuned to them, you're able to kind of sit back and relax and really just listen to what they have to offer. And they have so much to offer. The bass, one of the things I noticed about these speakers with the bass is that thanks to the fact that it's extended all the way down to about 30 hertz, you hear more bass. And you're not hearing a lot of bass rumble because it's not bloated bass like sometimes you may get from a speaker that has a high Q, like a peak in that mid-bass region. It's pretty linear and it does roll off at a reasonable rate, which will allow you to put on maybe about two feet from the wall, but honestly, I wouldn't go any closer to that. And I'm talking from the back of the speaker to the wall behind it. The way that the bass, I don't want to use the word articulated because that's such an audiophile slang word, but let me speak to it like this. If you're used to having a bookshelf speaker that gets down to maybe 60 hertz, or maybe you're used to having a speaker that gets down to 40 or 50 hertz. 40 hertz is low for a lot of speakers. When you have a tower speaker that can comfortably get down to 30 hertz, and I mean without breaking a sweat, and then you have other sounds that are going on in the 60, 70, 80 hertz region, you have low end, just crushing solid bass, but then you have, mm, let's say lower mid bass, thump and chest pump. And it's just, it's a hard thing to describe, but when you hear it, you hear levels on levels of bass that you haven't got to hear before. And the only way I think you're going to get this truly, and this is based on like years of experience, hundreds of systems is to have properly integrated subwoofers and the properly integrated is the key piece. I would guarantee. Yeah. I would guarantee that if I were somehow able to do a poll and listen to people's systems and measure them in room that I would find 80% of them do not have the proper gain crossover and phase alignment between their subwoofers and their mains. So with a speaker like this, where it's already integrated, it's one less thing you have to worry about and you get the benefit of low bass and really good detail in the mid bass region. One thing you might expect with a larger speaker is for it to not have precise imaging. Now there's a reason that people tend to believe that, but I'm gonna leave that out. Maybe a different video another day. These speakers don't have that problem. They image very well and very precise, which at least indicates to me that the frequency response matching between the two pair is really good. The other thing that I like about the speaker, as I mentioned earlier, there's a very enveloping sound to these speakers, but it's not just rectangle, rectangular, rectangular, it's spherical. So for my experience, the majority of speakers have, let's say it has a really good soundstage, right? And you could place images within the soundstage and it's got depth and it's got layering and all those things. But most of them, if you were to draw a line or encompass something about how those speakers are radiating sound, most of the time you're going to draw a big rectangle and you're going to say from left speaker to right speaker, and this is how far it stretches and it goes back this far, like front to back. That's pretty much average. With coaxial speakers and with this particular especially, what you get is a more 3D spherical sound wave or sound source. So instead of feeling like the sound stage is constrained within a box that has hard to find edges, you feel like you're listening to a big sphere of sound. Now I consider that a plus to me. That's a really great thing when you don't have hard defined edges in the sound stage. One problem I have had out of a lot of larger 
tower speakers, especially when they're multiple drive units. And this is at big shows, Expona, Audio Advice, um, just all the different audio shows that I've been to. A lot of times, unfortunately, it's pretty easy to tell that there is a crossover. Now, maybe exactly where that crossover is, harder to tell, but it's easy to tell that there is a crossover between the mid-range and the mid-woofer and the mid-range and the tweeter. And the reason that I noticed this with taller speakers is because you can hear distinct sounds from each driver. And that indicates that there's a phase issue or relationship in the crossover. So as you're listening, you might hear something that maybe pans left to right. Well, as it pans, it's also shifting up and down. The image is supposed to be in one place, but now it's spread out over two drivers. I notice this a lot with two and a half way designs in particular. Three way designs, usually a little bit less, but when a speaker has a really poor crossover implementation, then it's easy to notice this and it's extremely, uh, um, not confusing, what's the word I wanna use here? Distracting. It's extremely distracting because once you hear it, you cannot unhear it. With these speakers, I never noticed that. In the same vein with this low bass extension while also having nice mid bass clarity, the dynamicism of this speaker is fantastic. Fantastic. So this kind of goes hand in hand with having a speaker that will be playing a low bass note while at the same time playing a vocal note. And that will particularly be noticeable in a grainy compressed type sound. That will show up in multi-tone distortion as well. And it's pretty evident to see that when you see it and it's easy to relate to how you hear it. I didn't get that at all from these speakers. <laughs> in fact, uh, one of the first things that I was listening to at high level uh, was a Jeezy track and I was cranking it. I was averaging around a hundred decibels or so at about 10 feet away. Now I'm not saying I listen to speakers like that, that loud all the time, but I really just wanted to stress test it and see how loud I could push these speakers. They did everything just fine. There was no signs of weakness, though so increased distortion region that I noticed that caused my attention to be taken away from the enjoyment factor of the speaker. The overall timbre and tone of these speakers is what I would consider neutral. Now there are some non-linearities and we're gonna see that in the data in a second, but for the most part, I consider this speaker a neutral speaker. So now let's take a look at some of the data, but first we're gonna do a quick sound clip demo. And this is what you heard. You can see that the average sensitivity is measured at about 89 decibels. There are some nonlinearities. So we've got this one around 80 Hertz, a little bit of a saddle. We've got the dip around 300 Hertz. That's a resonance that looks like it's from the enclosure. And then you've got a couple little nonlinearities in the higher frequency. Now, according to pretty much any coaxial manufacturer, pointing the speaker directly at your ear is not a good idea. So for this particular speaker, I also measured it at 15 degrees off axis. And that's what you see here. Once you do that, you smooth out the upper mid range and treble response. Now, if we look at the CEA 2034 data set at 15 degrees, this is the estimated in-room response. And this line kind of indicates how I heard the speaker. So normally I point out the things that, hey, they drew attention to themselves. But honestly, even after seeing the data and going back and listening, sure, maybe I could hear these things, but did it bother me? No, because there were other things about the speaker that it did so well that nothing else I've listened to does that these little issues I could forgive. Now, some of you may be saying, well, why do you call them out in other speakers? Uh, because they stand out in other speakers to me when I listen to them. I don't just measure this stuff. I listen to these things and I listen to them for a long time and I've gotten pretty damn good at identifying what I'm hearing and I'm able to see it in the data. But sometimes a speaker comes along that does so many other things that are so awesome to me that it takes away the critical aspect of my listening and puts it basically on, hey dude, these speakers are pretty awesome. And that's that. Burst decay, horizontal contour plot, we can see the radiation is about plus or minus 60 degrees. If we go to the vertical radiation, about plus or minus 60 degrees as well. So what this means for most people, if you don't know, is that instead of having to lock your ears at the tweeter position, you have about plus or minus 60 degrees of wiggle room. 
Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels, really low, below about 1%. Multitone distortion shows us some peaking going on around 4K, not entirely sure what that is. I didn't have an issue with that. My main thing that I'm listening for in these kind of testing is, can I hear a graininess or a compression issue in the mid range? And I definitely did not hear that from this speaker and this data tends to show me why. What about long-term compression 30 seconds at a time? These speakers have practically zero compression, even with long-term pink noise being played. And then if you go to short-term instantaneous dynamic compression, practically nothing. For the impedance, we see that there is this dip around 300 Hertz. This is what I called out earlier that showed up in the frequency response. Minimum EPDR is at 3.1, minimum impedance is at 5.3. So these speakers actually have low impedance. When you view it from, it's not taxing on the amplifier. That's actually surprising. I didn't realize that until just now. If you use these speakers with different amplifiers, going from a reference, which would be this black one, so an amplifier with a really high damping factor to an amplifier with really low damping factor. For the mid range and the high frequency, practically no change, okay? But as you go down into the bass region, if you're using something like a pair of tube amplifiers and they have a very high output impedance on the low region, you can lose some bass thump around 50, 60 Hertz. And then this is what it would look like in terms of frequency response. In looking at the frequency response, we can see that there seems to be some compromise there. There are some elements of maybe diffraction or a little bit of perturbations here, you know, oscillating within a decibel or so. Not huge things on the grand scale, but they do stand out in a graphic. As far as being audible though, I mean, I don't know if you're going to hear those little things. Frankly, I never did. I wasn't, I wasn't keyed into them. And for the most part, I was enjoying my, my time with these speakers so much that I never really stopped to say, all right, I got to be critical about these now. I'm not, I don't do that with every review, but most of the time what happens is something will rear its ugly head and then I'll become more critical about it. And then it's hard for me to not focus on that. Even after I went and saw the data, after I did the measurements, saw the data and then listened again, I just didn't notice the things that the on-axis linearity or the off-axis linearity were showing me. So I feel like, yeah, there probably is some compromise in the overall smoothness of the response in certain areas, but it gives you deep bass extension, wide horizontal and wide vertical radiation and extremely low distortion. So for me, this is a speaker that probably has the best set of compromises all the way around. And in my own personal opinion, it's pretty much the chef's kiss. It's like exactly what I'm looking for out of a speaker. So if you like what you see here, if you want to support the channel, you can do so a couple different ways. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. You can use any of my generic affiliate links in the description section or in the pinned comment below. And you can also, if you plan to buy these speakers, use my direct affiliate link also in the comment section below. It'll be pinned at the top. Doing that, again, earns me a small commission. It doesn't cost you a single thing extra, but that commission allows me to do more of these kind of reviews. And honestly, man, it just... If I want to buy something cool for myself, it gets me there too. All right. This isn't my day job, but if it makes me money, that's awesome. I appreciate your time. Hope you learned something. If you have any questions, ask me and I will do my best to answer them. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.